thought I got you all out And even with new skin and a different life You get under, you get in And every bullet that came with an edge of life Was it the flame you tried to kill? words on me even still, 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 still and I'm afraid they always will Be 
Of such faraway bodies. 
Uh, all of that is learned by unraveling the light captured in telescopes. Um, and I'd like to take a quick moment though to thank our members. Your support is what makes all of this possible now more than ever. Uh, you know, as a private nonprofit organization, OMSI does not receive operating uh, funds, uh, excuse me, operating support from local, state, or federal government sources. We hope to continue our educational mission to share science education with communities across the region and bring exciting programs and exhibits to the museum. And this requires earned revenue and contributions from generous donors, members, and supporters. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being members. We really appreciate it and we hope to see you all soon. Uh, we are committed to sparking curiosity and igniting imaginations, but since this can't happen in the museum right now, we have crafted and curated all sorts of engaging science activities and experiments to inspire you to experience the wonder of science from wherever you are. So go to our website, omsi.edu for more information. You'll see the at home section there. Uh, and if you do any of these science activities, send us some photos or videos so we can see just how great a scientist you are. Now, putting on these live shows uh, takes a lot of work and we have an amazing partner that has been helping us uh, make this happen. So a huge thank you and a big shout out to Celestream for providing the live streaming services for tonight's Science Club. We really appreciate their support. Now, I, if you enjoyed uh, the music tonight during our little pre-show, uh, we're really excited to showcase local Portland artist, Stephanie Schneiderman. Uh, you can catch her live at the upcoming Kendall concert in our planetarium later this fall. Um, and you can check her out on the Thursday Night Live show on Facebook. Now, Okay, next slide. So guess what? There is something you can do right now to support your local community. We have some really great food and beverage partners, and I would really encourage you to put the pub back into the Science Pub experience. So go ahead and order some delicious food and some tasty beverages from one of our partners around the state. Okay, let's talk scheduling or the agenda for tonight. So tonight's event is going to be very similar to our regular Science Pub, pub program. And for those of you who don't know what a regular Science Pub looks like, we'll begin with some uh, astronomy themed trivia just to get, a, get you warmed up for tonight's talk. So make sure to get a pen and paper so you can participate or bust out your, uh, uh, your phone with a little notepad there. And after that, we'll have about a 50 to 60 minute lecture by Dr. Shriver. And after that, we'll move into some Q&A. Now, for the Q&A, you can submit your questions during the lecture via the comments in our live feed, either uh, on, face, uh, on Facebook there, and then we'll collect them up after the lecture, and then I will ask Dr. Shriver your questions. Now, um, if you enjoyed tonight's lecture, or you enjoy Science Pub, or you love OMSI for any of those reasons, uh, I would humbly ask that you please consider making a donation to help support OMSI. Uh, you can use the donate button on our Facebook page, or you can visit omsi.edu slash donate. Now, don't worry, there's no pressure to donate. Our mission at OMSI is to inspire curiosity by creating engaging science learning experiences for, experiences for people of all ages and backgrounds. So sit back, relax, and get ready for a great lecture right after our trivia. Okay, this week, for our special trivia, we have one of our awesome OMSI educators joining us to play along live with you at home. So please give a warm welcome to Alex. Alex, this is your round of applause from everyone oh, watching thanks. right now. Uh, it's wonderful to see you as always. So Likewise. Alex, tell me, what are you most excited to learn about during tonight's show? I, to be totally honest with you, I'm not totally sure. I'm, I'm gonna open open the door just a little bit to maybe I don't know. I might be setting myself up for failure for trivia, but I'm a bit of an amateur astronomer, so oh. I'm just this is this is my jam. I'm gonna get to engage my space brain. I'm excited. Okay, well, because normally you engage your chemistry brain. Normally I engage my chemistry brain, but That's right. everyone Alex is also the coolest. Alex runs our chemistry lab. So if you ever want to come in and learn some chemistry, Alex will take care of you. 
Okay, well, I tell you what, let's get started with trivia. So everyone at home, grab a pen or pencil, get some paper so you can play against your family. You know, maybe make it interesting. Maybe you play for some bragging rights. Uh, maybe play for who's doing dishes next, take out the trash, you know, whatever. Um, we have 10 multiple choice questions. I will read out a question. I'll give you some time to guess and then reveal the answer before moving on to the next one. Okay. I have, are, I have my letters. Are you ready? Oh, and that's right. You have your cards. Yes. Okay. Here we go. So, Alex, okay. going from cool to hot, what is the order in which a heated body glows? Okay. So it's much like much like fires, blue blue fire is going to be hotter than orange fire. So going from cool to hot, so cool the cooler end of the spectrum is going to be the reds and then blues are going to be hotter. So I'm going to go with C. Ooh. Red, yellow, blue. That's that's not a bad guess. I would have guessed totally the opposite. Let's see what happens. Yeah. It is C. Red, yellow, blue. You, you know, when I was a kid and I wanted my dad to turn up the heat in the house, he said, just go stand in the corner. It's 90 degrees. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Number two. I'm looking forward to more of this. I know. It's all it's it's happening. Number two. What is the speed of light? Is it A, 0.7 million miles an hour, 6.7 million miles an hour, 67 million miles an hour, or 670 million miles an hour? See, here's the thing. I know this answer for sure in the metric system. <laughs> <laughs> so it's 3.8 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. <laughs> Word. Great. Now just translate that over to one of these uh, answers. Exactly. That's the thing. I am gonna. Oh, okay. Real fast. I'm gonna go with. Not. No, I feel okay. I feel good about this. Where or is it mine too? D. All right. What is the speed of light? D. Yes. That is correct. Math. 670 Sweet. million miles per hour. You know, Alex, you matter. Unless you multiply yourself um, by the speed of light, then you energy. Then you energy. Yes. <laughs> All right. a joke. Love it. All right. Wh okay. Which of these is not a kind of light? A, okay. microwaves. B, radar. C, cosmic rays. Or D, x-rays. Okay. So, I do know this one. So you've got your different kinds of lights, sort of your spectrum of like different levels of energy, microwaves and x-rays are definitely on there. But what I happen to know is that cosmic rays, despite having a name that sounds a lot like x-rays, cosmic rays are actually particles. Oh, let's see. So your answer is C, final yeah. answer. Oh man, look at you go. Yeah. You know, when I when I saw uh, microwaves down there, it made me think of warming up food, and it actually reminded me of a conversation two of my plants had the other night. The one plant said to another, "Are you hungry?" And the other guy said, "Yeah, I could use a light snack." Hey. <laughs> and then the third one goes, "Oh my gosh, a talking plant." <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even plan that, people. I swear, she and I did not plan that. Okay. <laughs> Number four. All right. Okay. okay. Please don't look at the sun to confirm. It's not that you could in Portland, but- I was gonna say, <laughs> yeah, no dice. You can try if you want. Uh, what is the color of the sun as our eyes would see it? A, white, B, yellow, C, orange, or D, red? Okay, yes, reiterating, very much do not look at the sun. Yeah. Bad, bad plan, bad for eyeballs. Yes. Okay. Hmm. So it's one of two things. I'm between white and yellow. That's kind of where I was thinking. Cause depending on how physics nerd you want to get, I'm pretty sure like it gives off a lot of yellowish greenish light. But I think if you're looking at like, what is the color of the sun? If you were to look at it, I'm going to uh, white. White. Okay, let's try. A, a final answer. Colors? Oh, there it is. 
even though it's called a yellow, it's called a yellow star, because yeah, yeah. that's where most that of the energy is emitted, emitted, but to the human eye, it would be white. This is very interesting. You know, in fact, interesting. I was up all night wondering where the sun had gone. And then it dawned on me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get serious here. Serious science. Okay, question five. There's a lot of that going on right now. <laughs> yeah, so much serious. <laughs> question five. Which right, answer Focus on is most, oh my gosh, <laughs> these questions are the worst. Which one's most, most correct? Most okay. correct. Which one is most correct? Okay. A star is A, a large sphere of gas, B, a large sphere of gas with thermonuclear fusion in its core, C, a hot sphere of gas that glows brightly, or D, like a planet, but hotter. <laughs> <laughs> I, like that. I like that last one. No. Um, that's not my answer. Um, okay, so most correct. So there's only one correct answer. Yeah. Okay. Most correct, I'm gonna say sphere of gas that is fusing stuff. Okay. Because that's what gives it its light. There it is, B. Yeah. It is a large sphere of gas with thermonuclear fusion in its core. You know, speaking about spheres and round celestial ob objects, <laughs> my flat earther friend decided to travel to the edge of the earth to prove it's flat. And in the end, he came around. He came around, oh, I love it. <laughs> okay, question six. Which two reasons two make astronomers need large telescopes? Okay, so why do astronomers need large telescopes? Two reasons, so you gotta pick two. Okay. A, to collect light needed for measurements. B, to increase the field of view so more of the sky can be seen. C, to image finer details of small or distant objects or D, to smooth over small-scale atmospheric turbulence. Whoa. Okay. We got some. Okay. Oh, it's Pine Mountain. Oh, nice. I didn't see where the picture was from. Okay. So... Sorry, my cat thinks it's getting time. Um... Ask your cat. You can phone a friend. Hey, Violet, what do you think? Oh, she's too far away. I was going to grab her and see what she thought. She wouldn't um, have told you anyway. She might not have. She has not been observing with me yet. So two reasons. So one of them is going to be to collect light because okay. that's how you do the seeing thing. Got it. And the other one, it's not going to be to increase the field of view because you want... You want, you want the details. So I'm gonna go with A and C. Okay, final answer. Yeah. A and C, there it is. Boom, okay. So more light for measurements and to image finer myself. details. You know, when the astronomy department found out that their professor wasn't gonna get the Nobel Prize that year, they threw him a party and gave him a constellation prize instead. <laughs> That's delightful. Oh, so That's good. a good one, I haven't heard that one. I know, I'm full of them, okay. Number seven, the Doppler effect is not used in which of these? A, Ooh. traffic speed traps, B, cell phone location tracking, C, submarine sonar, or D, ultrasound procedures. <laughs> okay. So I know about the Doppler effect as it relates to astronomy, because that'll change how the light looks if it's moving towards you it'll be bluer in a way is more red because it messes with the waves but okay traffic no i feel like traffic speed traps uses the doppler effect i feel like that's how they get that information i don't know about sonar sonar seems like it'd be similar i'm gonna go with that's GPS. That's cell phone location tracking is I'm gonna I'm gonna go I'm gonna go with cell phone okay. location tracking. Cell phone I think location that's tracking. B final answer. B final answer. Correct. Yes. Cell okay. phone location tracking. Right. And you know, awesome. with those traffic speed traps, I would tell you a, a, a traffic pun, but I think it would drive you crazy. It might. <laughs> <laughs> All right. See if I were quicker, I could come up with responses. Ah. 
question Sunday. eight. Okay. Now we got to read this one a little slowly. The color of a hot glowing solid object observed without external lights. A depends on what it's made of. B does not depend on what it's made of. So the color, does the color depend okay. or not depend? Wait, the color of a hot <laughs> glowing solid object observed without external lights depends on what it's made of, does not depend on what it's made of. Hmm. And might I remind you, you are seven for seven right now. You've been doing pretty well. Oh, you were keeping track. Awesome, because I forgot to do that. <laughs> cool. I was only keeping track because you haven't gotten any wrong yet. You're 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 crushing us. Nice. nice. Degree is worth something. Sweet. Okay. So hmm. This is a tricky one. Well, because you could <laughs> I could go, I could go deep sort of chemistry physics nerd because depending on what it's made of and how those electrons are bouncing around, it's going to give off different colors, but temperature is really what we're looking at when you're looking at the color of the whole thing. I'm going to go with does not depend on what it's made of. All right. Let's see. B. Does not depend on what it's made out of. You know, it's like you know, with all those photons. It's like when that photon checked into a hotel and at and the and the bellhop asked if he needed any help with his luggage. He said, "Now nah, I'm traveling light." He's traveling light. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right, number nine. Almost business. there. Okay. Okay. This one is going to be kind of tricky. How many exoplanetary systems are known today, oh. as of like this month? As of like right now. Whoa. Right now. Three. Oh, okay. B thirty. C, 308, <laughs> D, 3,081. Okay. I was nervous when the when you read the question because it's not like I've looked lately. Yeah. Um, but I feel, ooh, okay, that's a dangerous. I was going to say the phrase I feel relatively confident about. I feel like 3 and 30 are way too low. I even yeah. feel like I feel like we're out of the hundreds. I feel like we've broached at least four digits. We have to have, right? We have, we have, I, I okay. feel like we have to have at least more than a couple hundred. Okay, here we go. 90 D 3081. Wow. You can actually go to exoplanets.nasa.gov. You can learn about all sorts of cool stuff. You know, it's like the exoplanets cool. and black holes and super, you know, it's like the black hole and the supernova. They walk into a bar and the black hole points and says, I'll have what he's having. <laughs> <That's supernova solution. laughs> such All right, last question. Okay. How long oh, does it gosh. take light to travel to earth from the nearest star, not our sun, the nearest star, which I believe is called. Is Alpha it Centauri? Centauri. Yeah. Is it six months? Is it a year and two months? Three years and seven months? Or four years and four months? <sighs> huh. Okay, it's definitely not six months. Nope. That's way too short. Yeah. To Earth from Alpha and Proxima Centauri. Okay, I'm feeling either three years and change or four years and change, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure which it is between the two. Um, well, we're in the final countdown here. Na, na, na. Um, I'm going to go, I don't know. Space is really, space is huge. I'm space is big. pretty huge. Space, okay. is, space is a big place. Okay. D four years, four months, final answer. And the answer is yes. Four years, four months. You are 10 for 10. Boom. You know, oh, I mean, love it. My favorite stars are found in the constellation Orion, but you know, to me, his his belt is just a big waste of space. The waste of space. But, um, <laughs> I know, it's oh. terrible. It's a, it's a three star joke at best. <laughs> oh, and, the, and it just keeps coming. Oh, it's man. So bad. So much better. Okay, well, hey. No, but it's so delightful. All right, that was Thank fun. So you. thanks that for joining us, Alex. 
And Alex, thank you for enduring my relentless onslaught of puns. But you know what? Just for good measure. My I'm pleasure. Gonna, I'm going to leave you with one more. Please do. And our friends. Uh, you know, yesterday my kids asked me what infinity means. And I said, you know what? You better sit down. This is going to take forever. <laughs> okay. I'm locking that one away. All right. That's good. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Thank you, team. Now I would like to introduce our speaker. Carl is an astrophysicist specializing in the magnetism of the sun and sunlight stars. He received his doctorate at the University of Utrecht in the Netherlands and then worked at the University of Colorado, the European Space Agency, and the Royal Netherlands Academy of Sciences before joining the Lockheed Martin Advanced Technology Center in Palo Alto, California. There, he studied not only the sun, but also the impact of solar variability on society. He served as the science lead and later the principal investigator for two of NASA's best known solar viewing instruments, the Trace Satellite and the Coronal Telescopes on board the Solar Dynamics Observatory. He is the recipient of the NASA Exceptional Public Service Medal for 2019, and he moved to the Portland area in 2016. His two recent popular science books explore our place in the universe. Living with the Stars looks into the many connections between the human body, the Earth, the planets, and the stars, while one of 10 billion Earths tells the story of the many exoplanetary systems discovered in recent decades and how they inform us about the Earth's history. Take it away, Dr. Schreiber. Thank you, Doc, John, <clears throat> and thank you all for dialing into this uh, virtual science pub. I'm going to talk to you tonight about light as the most important astronomer's tool. Um, and I'm not going to talk about designs of telescopes. I'm not talking about the physics of light. I'm going to try to give you the basics of why we can use light to learn all the things that we've learned as astronomers in the universe. You know, you know astronomers have only four ways to learn about something. Um, one is you can use cosmic rays, for example. You can use energetic particles that come, this is ordinary matter, it's hydrogen and helium and carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, everything else that we have here on Earth, but it moves at nearly light speed. The problem with that is, however, that all those particles moving around come from all directions around the solar system. And that's because whenever they encounter some magnetic field in the galaxy, they change direction. So effectively, we're looking at a fog. We're looking at like light would come in a fog from just everywhere and you can't see anything in it. These energetic particles, the cosmic rays, come from anywhere in the universe, mostly from the galaxy, but we can't tell where from originally. So they don't help us understand the things that make the galaxy, the things that make the solar system, stars or planets. Another way to learn about things uh, is gravi gravitational waves. Now, these are things that were discovered from the equations that Albert Einstein wrote down uh, about a century ago and a little bit, but they've only been discovered to actually exist, confirmed by observations, maybe 10 years ago, and they tell us about things that are the most energetic and unusual things in the universe, like when two entire stars collide. That doesn't happen very often, and again, it doesn't help us understand what stars and planets are really about. There are, however, those astronomers among us that are lucky. There are astronomers that actually can go somewhere. Well, typically they can't go somewhere, but they can send a satellite out. And those are the ones working in the solar system. So if you're an astronomer working on planets or moons or comets or asteroids, uh, you have a whole host of satellites that have flown out to all these different bodies, either past them by taking pictures, uh, or in some cases landed on them, even on comets and asteroids. And in very few cases, they've taken a sample and brought it back to Earth. I think, as far as I can remember, that's two cases. But even the sun itself is, although it's relatively close by compared to the star, not something that we can actually go to. It's so hot that if we sent a probe to the sun, literally to the surface of the sun, it would evaporate into its constituent atoms. There's nothing that would survive, nothing that could come 
back to us. So we're left with the fourth way, which is, in fact, the, the first way, the way that astronomy has worked for the longest time, for centuries and millennia now, light. Now I'm going to make a few differentiations between what kind of light I'm talking about. The first kind that I'd like to do is this. This is a picture of Cannon Beach. At times we could all go there, even though in this particular day there was hardly anybody there because there was rain and some storm. It made for a pretty picture. And what you're looking at here is a landscape lit by the sun with light reflected by the beach and the mountains and the trees and the clouds and also reflected by a whole host of uh, raindrops that are floating in the sky northward from where we are standing uh, with the sun behind us, creating this rainbow. This is largely reflected light because it's light that comes from behind us, goes into the cloud, bumps into clouds, and comes into rain clouds, sorry, clouds of raindrops, not into the clouds proper, but the raindrops underneath them. But there's something else that happens at that point. When light goes through an object like a raindrop, it's what we call refracted. It's broken ever so slightly into its constituent colors. And those colors then are reflected back to us along slightly different pathways. And that's what causes the rainbow. So the light of the sun is now broken into a spectrum that ranges from a deep purple on the lower end to a bright deep or deep red at the upper end. And I think if you look really carefully, you can see a second rainbow that sits a few degrees out of this, which is the other way around. But the primary rainbow is this. Now, what makes this light, the, the one property that all of this light has in common is that it is all reflected light. Some of it also refracted. It's not the light from the source itself. After all, the sun is right behind us. And I'm going to come back to that difference between the light that comes from something versus the light that is reflected from something in just a moment. First, let me go to what light is, because when you look at this rainbow, uh, what you're seeing is a very narrow band of the colors that the human eye can actually see. Light comes in many, many more forms. It comes, if you read along the top of that line here, from uh, the least energetic and the longest wavelength light in the radio domain through microwaves and infrared, then you hear it's this narrow band of the visible. Then there's the ultraviolet, the X-ray, and the gamma ray domain. And at the bottom, they've tried to give you a picture of how big these waves are. The wavelengths of gamma rays are the size of a nucleus, which is really exceptionally strong, small. It's not something that we could ever hope to see uh, with the human eye. Even X-ray structures are often on the size of a molecule uh, or the size of a virus. By the time you get into the ultraviolet, you might get to some red blood cells and the larger bacteria. But it's, you don't get to things that we would normally see with the human eye until you get to structures that are considerably larger. So their own wave, their, the matching wavelengths would be in the far infrared and microwave and radio. Now, in order to observe something, you have to have the right kind of eye. You have to have an eye that is tuned to what you want to see. And the problem with radio is that because the waves are so long, your telescope has to be vastly bigger than your waves are long. Otherwise, you cannot observe it. So you have to build telescopes that are bigger than the Statue of Liberty, in this case, in this particular diagram, before you can start to make images. For the visible, something like the human eye can see most things that we have to deal with in most of ordinary life, except we can't see the very smallest things like these cells and bacteria that you'd like to look at. Anyway, let me show you a few examples of telescopes, telescopes that are specifically designed to observe the kind of light that astronomers are learning a lot from. And you can see from just these pictures at the bottom that telescopes can look very, very different. Uh, the one in the middle at the top now there, I hope you'll recognize, is the Hubble Space Telescope. And the Hubble Space Telescope has been flying in space for two and a half decades now. 
And the reason it's in space, well, there's two reasons. One is, of course, if you're in space, you're above clouds and atmospheric turbulence, and you don't have to worry about day-night cycles, the sun setting and rising all the time. But more importantly for the space telescope, it also gives it access to ultraviolet, which does not penetrate to the surface of the Earth. I'll show you that in the diagram in just a moment. And then we build big visible light or optical telescopes um, that are getting ever bigger, and I'll show you a whole bunch of examples of how big they are. And then there are these things that are radio telescopes, or in this case, actually, it's a microwave telescope. So it's quite sh a little bit shortward of a, a radio telescope. Now, the thing to realize about a radio telescope is it contains a lot of these dishes. One dish does not make a telescope. One dish is essentially a light bucket. It gathers light so it can measure an intensity, a brightness of whatever is in front of it, but it cannot make an image. In order to make an image of something as the size of tens or hundreds or thousands of feet across, you need to have a telescope that is much larger than that. So what people do is they string together a whole array of these dishes and then with very clever electronics, it used to be very clever cabling, nowadays we do it in computers, people bring together the intensity measures, measurements from all of these individual dishes, and out of that, they can create an image. I'm gonna come back to this issue of light from a surface, light from an object itself and reflected light. And I think one example case is what you can see here. Obviously, sunlight lights up the street here of the poor neighborhood um, of Makamea Street in Hawaii, where you can see that the trees and the road and the grasses are lit up by sunlight. But the lava also glows. And the lava, where it's hot enough, glows in a color that we can see. Uh, here and there, wherever it touches branches, you might say that's a flame. But most of this glow is not a flame. It's the intrinsic glow of something that is very hot. And those are the kinds of objects that I'm talking about, because those are the kinds of things that astronomers use. So if I put this in terms of light bulbs, there's lots of different light bulbs around nowadays. The one in the middle, the incandescent light, is being phased out because it's not particularly effective, efficient in use of energy. But it really is the one that you'd like to use as an astronomer because it's the one that's glowing of its own accord. The LED lamps, the light emitting diode lamps, they emit light, but they're not glowing because they're hot. They never get very hot. You can always just touch them and unscrew them or uh, touch them even after they've been burning for a very long time. These are designed so that the little silicon wafers that make the light uh, emit very particular kinds of light because we run a current through them. And then we mix the colors so that what comes out may look like white or red or blue. Either these nice party lights, you can even tune from one color to another just because the way that the current runs through it and the types of diodes that are being used in it. But they do not glow because they're hot. Same is true of a fluorescent lamp. There's a current of electrons running through the tube. They collide with whatever's in the tube. That emits all sorts of light, but not the nice glowing light. And in the fluorescence process, there's this dust coating on the tube itself, on the inside, that's converted into something that is whitish. Although many people complain that it's actually sort of a bluish light, it's unpleasant, it's not a daylight color. And then there is the sodium lights. They too don't get very hot, although they get hotter than most others in these pictures, um, except the incandescent light. But they only emit light in very particular wavelengths. In the case of sodium, two colors of yellow really close together and nothing else. So no, those are not the ones I'm talking about. I'm talking about the one in the center, the one that we're phasing out, incandescent. The, the spiral in the center gets hot to thousands of degrees and glows at light that is orangey to white, depending on how hot we let that glow spiral get. And then there's a very clever design of a property of the gas that sits inside the bulb that keeps most of that heat from simply being conducted out to this, the sphere of glass, which would otherwise melt. 
but you still can never touch a light, that, like a lamp like this if it's burning. It's a very unwise idea. It's a hot thing. We can make things hotter still. Here's a diagram that shows you how things glow to the human eye as a function of temperature. And you can pick your favorite temperature scale, centigrade or Fahrenheit. Um, and as you go towards higher and higher temperatures, what you see is that things turn from a deep red. In fact, they start in the infrared before even becoming visible to the human eye. And they get hotter and hotter through these oranges into yellows and eventually this whitish yellow at um, about 1300 centigrade or 2400 Fahrenheit. That's not the point at which this scale ought to end, but it says this is the Smith's color chart. And that's literally, it's not Joe Smith or Frank Smith, it's the blacksmith's color chart. It's the chart that a blacksmith would use to estimate how hot something is by just looking at the color of, the, uh, of whatever they have in the fire to work on. If they go above 1300 centigrade, if they go off this scale, what happens is the steel that they're working on will melt. And then you can't work it anymore. Or unless you're interested in pouring it, casting iron, you'd have to be above that brightness before it will properly pour. For astronomers, we like big numbers. Uh, so we go way beyond this scale. We actually look at stars that have temperatures that go even beyond the 12,000 degrees here centigrade. Uh, so almost double that in Fahrenheit. And what you see there is, yes, it picks up at the lower end where the top chart leaves off in oranges and reds, and then it becomes this whitish. Around 6,000 degrees, by the way, it's mostly white. That's where the sun sits. As, as we heard in one of the trivia questions, the sun is a white star. And if we go even hotter than that, the stars would turn blue. Now, there's one thing to remember here. This is what we see. This is not what is emitted. At every one of these colors, at every one of these temperatures, there's a whole range of colors being emitted. So if we pick the 6,000 degrees of the sun, uh, Kelvin or 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, this bottom scale happens to be in Kelvin or centigrade, which are not all that different at this temperature. Um, it clearly emits all the colors in the rainbow. But if you combine all the colors in the rainbow, the way the human eye sees it, it looks like white. Now, here's the most curious thing of everything. Uh, by experimenting in the lab, scientists determined that the color of something that glows, so the light that comes from an object itself, not the light that is reflected from something else, the color of a thermally glowing object, and it doesn't matter if it's a solid or a liquid or a dense gas, doesn't depend on what it's made of. It only depends on what its temperature is. And that's a wonderful thing for astronomers because for the longest time, of course, we didn't know what stars were made of, but we knew they were pretty dense. So we knew that the temperatures that we would measure, the colors that we would measure would be an indication of the temperature, regardless of what the stars would be made of. This is used on Earth uh, for very cool objects in infrared. It is used in space for extremely hot things all the way to x-rays. And I'm going to give you an example of both in a few uh, slides from now on. So here's the, the first example. This is infrared photography of animals. And as long as your camera allows to measure at least two, ideally a few more colors, you can determine temperatures from this because after all, it doesn't matter what it is, what it is made of. It gives you just the temperature if you can determine the color. So let's look at the ostriches. These are ostriches walking around. I'm guessing it's a cold day because this color scale touches on zero. That would be centigrade, so freezing point. Um, and some of the feathers that you can see are pretty much like just that, oh, a very light dark purple or maybe even black. So one or two or three degrees above freezing. Well, that's where the thickest feather package uh, is wrapping around the body of the ostrich. So the body of the ostrich is very well insulated. The heat doesn't escape very effectively and the outer layers can cool to the temperature of the surroundings 
to just a few degrees. But the parts of the ostrich where there aren't very many feathers, so the neck, the head, and the upper legs, they shine considerably hotter. Not body temperature, because the skin does cool down a bit, but considerably hotter. Then there's a lion, also in a desert setting, because here too it is really cold in some of the parts, particularly the manes, that the manes are the same here, behaving the same as the feathers of the ostrich. They're good insulators, considerably removed from the hot body of the lion, they go dark and purple in this color scale. These are artificial colors because we can't see infrared colors, so somebody assigned colors. But look at the body of the lion. Now lions don't have feathers, lions have fur, but fur are not nearly as effective on, this, on the body of the lion in insulating it from the outside as the manes are. So the body is warmer and glows warmer. And then there are the eyes and the ears and the nose and the mouth. And the same is true for the deer on the top left and the polar bear on the bo bottom left. Particularly the eyes and the ears and the mouth show up as bright. And that's because that's where the blood vessels are close to the surface, because that's what makes eyes and ears and noses uh, function effectively. They need blood flow to function. And here's the thing, not only do they change in color, they are the brightest thing here. So as you heat something up, it not only gets yellower and eventually bluer, it also gets brighter. And those are the things that astronomers use to understand stars. Now I'm gonna get into what's probably the most technical slide um, of the entire talk, but bear with me because once we've had this, you are a good enough spectroscopist to understand what's happening in a few of the next slides after this and why astronomers can use this tool as well as they do. The top one is fairly straightforward. I've already talked about most of that. If you have something like hot steel, in this case so hot you can pour it, and you take the light and shine it through uh, the prism, break it up in, in, in uh, constituent colors, you see what you would think is the solar spectrum, or something like the solar spectrum. It's called a continuous spectrum. All the colors of the light are present. Now, this is funny when you look at the next line. If you had a box of gas, ideally with no walls, but let's say we can make artificial walls, or in a star, let's say we have a cloud of hot gas that isn't necessarily bound by itself, but somehow held down by gravity around a star, and you break up its light, what you see is nothing like a continuous spectrum. What you're seeing is emission lines. And emission lines are a signature of quantum mechanics. And nobody can explain quantum mechanics entirely, certainly not in a single talk, so I won't even try. But what happens is this. In the hot, tin, thin gas, the atoms are mostly left alone. So they float around. Occasionally, there's a collision between two. And that upsets one of the electrons that orbit the nucleus which puts it in a different energy level, which puts it in a different orbit. Now, people used to think about these things as planetary systems with things orbiting like orbits, like the planets would orbit the star, but that's, that's just not how it works. So I'm not even trying to try and show you that. You just have to think about this as if a collision happens, an electron can be moved to a higher energy level. But quantum mechanics says, no, no, you can't move it to just any level. There are only these possible levels to which you can go. And out of these possible levels, you can jump down in energy again to some lower level. And again, only a few are allowed. And these in energy levels correspond to the colors. And the fascinating thing here is that every single element shines at its own set of spectral lines, of emission lines. So as soon as you get a map of the emission lines, you could look at a library and say, this is what's in there, because I know these lines and they correspond to these wavelengths. That combination is very powerful to astronomers, but it gets even better. It gets even better in the bottom line. The bottom line is odd because now you have this continuous spectrum, but light has been taken out 
at very particular wavelengths, namely the lines that correspond to the emission of the gas, but now they're out. So how does that happen? Well, take the hot steel, shine the light out through the box of gas, then put it through uh, the, the, the prism and unravel the light in its colors. The continuous spectrum is still that glow from the hot steel. But now what's happened is that if you shine light onto a gas, a thin gas, those atoms can take light away at its own energy dump levels. So it doesn't have to be by collisions, it can also be by absorption. So look at this little one there. Uh, what happens there is there's an atom, it takes a photon, a parcel of light out of the beam, but now it can emit it in any direction. It doesn't have to go straight into the prism, it can go all over the place. So the effect of that is that there are fewer photons going in the direction of the prism and some sideways scattered light comes out of the hot thin gas. But the result is that the net, if the net emission that you see in that spectrum is no longer as bright as it was before that light was removed. The little two is basically showing you the other process by which this can happen. Once an atom absorbs a photon and it is involved in a collision, that energy can also be taken away and be part of the collision process by which the photon is effectively destroyed. It isn't even scattered sideways, it's just no longer there also leading to a darkening. And this is essentially everything you need to become a spectroscopist, at least in principle that you can understand what's going on. So now I'm gonna show you the solar spectrum. This is the spectrum of the sun from the deep red to the deep blue, um, with all the strips of color unraveled so strongly here that you have to fold them to see the whole thing on one slide. So it's just one strip after another, just strung together, from wavelength to wavelength, from the top to the bottom, from the long wavelengths to the short wavelengths. And based on what I just told you, you now know what you're looking at. You're looking at a hot, dense gas, the sun, causing the continuum spectrum. And you know that around that is a thin gas that causes the absorption lines. It takes that light away and either removes it through collisions or removes it through sideways scattering. So this is how we can learn that hot stars far, far away, and including the one that's closer to the sun, actually are consisting of a hot inner interior, gaseous dense interior, with a thinner atmosphere around it. Now, to become a real spectroscopist, that's tough. But an actual spectroscopy could look at each one of these lines and not just go to the library and say, these are these elements, because of course, all of these elements are essentially all the elements that we know, because everything is made of everything, but in different amounts. So if you, if you measured how strong these absorption lines are, how much light was taken away from the continuum spectrum, you can then measure how much material of a given kind is in the atmosphere of the star. And in fact, it can also tell you about the temperature of that atmosphere. It doesn't have to be the same and generally isn't the same as the surface of the star. It can be hotter or cooler. So that's the foundation of spectroscopy. This is only the optical part, the visible part of the light. There's far more light, as I've shown you uh, a little while ago. To get to that light, we typically have to get off the Earth. If you look at this diagram and ask yourself, how far does light of a given wavelength, color, energy level, get towards the Earth? Uh, there are only two windows in which it actually reaches the Earth's surface. One is um, the optical window, where the waves come to the surface, and ideally you put your observatory on a mountaintop so you don't have so much trouble with weather, or the radio window where the radio waves come all the way to the surface. But for all of the others, well, for some of the infrared, you might get away with flying a high altitude uh, space, uh, sorry, aircraft with a telescope in it, like the SOFIA Observatory has done for NASA for a long time. But most of these wavelengths are simply not accessible from Earth. If we want to know something about them, we got to go to space. 
Now I'm going to go to sort of this domain here. So somewhere between X-ray and ultraviolet, it's called the extreme ultraviolet. Nothing comes down below 100 kilometers or so into 50, 70 miles into the, sun, the Earth's atmosphere. We can't fly there anymore. So if we want to measure what things look like, we have to go to the sun. Um, this is a satellite rendering. It's not a picture. There was nobody there to take the picture in orbit, but it's, a, it's an artist impression of the Solar Dynamics Observatory. It's a Solar Dynamics Observatory um, that was launched a decade ago, and it's been looking at the sun ever since. It's a, it's a satellite that I was heavily involved in, and I was the science lead on the set of telescopes that you're seeing, and eventually became the principal investigator. Um, and you can see them in the bottom right there uh, with each of these telescopes just standing on the ground being assembled ready to be put onto that spacecraft each one of those is tuned to a specific very specific color in the extreme ultraviolet in fact each one of them is tuned to two or three of them and we have a, a mechanism inside that can change what it is that we're looking at so overall we have like a dozen different colors that we can look at the sun and there's another telescope at the bottom opposite to these fours, which is HMI, the Helioseismic and Magnetic Imager, which measures the magnetic field and does helioseismology. A talk all by itself, and I won't get into that, but in optical visible wavelengths. And this thing has been sending down a picture of one 4K picture every second, uh, two terabytes of data a day for 10 years straight, and it's a big archive, and you're welcome to look at it. You can find on the web the pictures of this, and it's only that 15-minute delay between being taken and then processed by the spacecraft, sent down to White Sands Ground Station, processed in our computers to be ready for viewing, calibrated and all, and then everybody in the world can just go and see what the sun looked like just 15 minutes ago, or 10 years ago, because it's a complete record of it. So when we go and look at this other telescope, the HMI, the visible telescope, what we see is the surface of the sun. And the surface of the sun sometimes has sunspots, and I've taken fairly old observations because until just this week, the sun hasn't been very active and there weren't any sunspots on its surface. So there, right now there's a few coming back and we hope that it'll be more because it's more exciting than a featureless sphere to look at. This body of gas is made mostly of hydrogen and helium. and a little bit of sprinkling of everything else. But you now know that that doesn't matter. The glow of the sun is the glow of a dense gas, and it'll glow like it does just because it's hot at close to 10,000 Fahrenheit, not because it's made of any particular element. This begins to change as I look at different colors. So here's another color. And now I have to say that from now on, as long as you see these pictures of the sun, these are all fake colors not because we like fake colors, but because these are not colors the human eye can see. These are not colors that get through the atmosphere of the earth. So we have to choose a color in the hope that we can remember what color we're talking about when we're talking about these structures. So let me take a little slice of this and compare it to what lies underneath it. And you can see that the spots that you see in one color are still there in another color, and that there are things surrounding the spots that now begin to brighten that you didn't see really very well when you looked at the surface. Those are all signatures of magnetism. I'll show you that in just a moment. But the sun has got a lot more surprises in store. It can go very much hotter than just these 15,000 Fahrenheit as you're looking at here. If I go to 100,000 Fahrenheit, like little strip on the left-hand side, you can see that not only is there structure on the disk, but also a lot of atmosphere sticking above the disk. So here we're getting the clue that these spectral lines that I showed you earlier, suggesting that there's an atmosphere on the sun that we can't see very well. We can see it if we go to the extreme ultraviolet, and it's a fascinating atmosphere. Um, if I could show you this as a movie, which I didn't want to try because I, you never know how, how this goes through a Zoom meeting, um, there'll be so much going on all the time. All of these structures are changing all the time, but it gets hotter still. So here we get two pictures on the right-hand side, and I'm just gonna go 
and show you the whole picture um, of what we call the solar corona. Now, this is fun. <laughs> to me, this is fun, and it's because I've been working on things like this my entire career. It's a beautiful image, a composite color image. So where it's blue and fairly dim, it's only about 2 million Fahrenheit. Where it's green, it's about 3 to 3.5 three million Fahrenheit. Where it becomes red, it's actually 3 to 4 to 5 million degrees Fahrenheit. So there's a great deal of temperature difference. This is not a few degrees difference like we're used to on Earth in the atmosphere. These are factors of five different sometimes uh, when we look at temperatures from one place to another on the sun. And I'd like to point out two really fundamental things in this image. Well, three. One, it sticks out over the limb. This is a thick, yeah, that's going to get confusing. It's a thick, thin atmosphere. It's a thin atmosphere. There isn't much there. It's what you would see during a solar eclipse. But it's a very broad band that wraps around the entire sun. The third thing is, and that's kind of surprising, the sun itself seems to be black. Well, it is, because the sun itself is 10,000 degrees. We're looking at millions of degrees, a thousand times hotter. The sun doesn't radiate in these colors in the extreme ultraviolet. For it to do that, it would have to be hundreds of times or more hotter itself before it does that. So it's a black sphere as far as this radiation is concerned. We're only looking at the atmosphere. Now in the lower left there, it says something curious. Light from iron ions. And this has led to some confusion where people might say, well, so the sun is made of iron. No, even the atmosphere that you're looking at is made of largely hydrogen and helium like the rest of the sun is. But if you make hydrogen, say, hot, the collisions between the hydrogen atoms get so intense that they knock electrons away from hydrogen and it's left with nothing. And if it's not left with an electron, it can't do this up and down jumping in energy. So there's no more spectral lines, no more light coming from hydrogen. If you make it hot enough, the same will happen to helium and to carbon and to nitrogen until you're left with only those atoms that manage to retain enough electrons that they can still create that dance in their collisions and emissions to send out light. And that's why we picked iron, because iron has so many, well, 23 electrons, um, but also it has, if it's, unless it's ionized, but it also has so many spectral lines that it's just a matter of just finding the right wavelength before you can tune your telescope to it and make images like this. And images like this are made to understand what makes the sun's magnetism tick. Uh, it changes all the time. It causes things like space weather when giant explosions occur. And it's the only star for which we can see any of this in any detail. So that's what we're doing. There's the other telescope, HMI, on the other side of SDO observes in white light, but it also has Polaroid glasses on. So when we put a polarizer, it's a complicated one, but it is essentially a polarizer, um, on the telescope, or deep inside the telescope, we can see polarization. And the funny thing about light is, it's an electromagnetic thing, <coughs> that if light travels through magnetic fields, it becomes polarized, and it becomes polarized depending on the direction of the magnetic field. So in this case, you'll see that there's magnetism, there's black and white patches all over the sun, and the black is one polarity and the white is another polarity. And wherever, I'm gonna go back and forth a few times if, uh, if the zoom can take it, wherever there's a lot of magnetic field, you can see that there's a lot of brightness in the overlying atmosphere. The field shapes the atmosphere and processes in the field help heat the atmosphere. Okay, one more time to make it explicit, this atmospheric thing. Here we are again with the solar spectrum with the absorption lines, because I'd like you to see it one more time, but now directly. So we go back to the transit of Mercury, which we observed in 1999. Now, transits of Mercury happen once every seven or eight years. There's 13 of them every century on average. So they're not all that rare. This one 
was rare because it just skirted the North Pole of the Sun. So if you look at the bottom set of images there, um, with the TRACE logo in it, it was the TRACE telescope that observed this, which I was also heavily involved with, and which is a precursor of the SDO telescopes, it was, uh, which were far more capable than the TRACE telescopes. Um, you see, let's look at the time there. There's 21 hours, 41 minutes, 38 seconds. The second one from the right. At that point, Mercury is just touching, the top end of Mercury is just touching the ed inner edge of the sol solar disk. Uh, by the way, I should say these are time snaps put together as a frequency. So for every one of the times that you see, there's a little band that goes for that particular time. And then it's strung together with a picture here that's this big and a picture here that's this big. And we just put a whole series of these pictures together so that you could have an idea of the time evolution of this. And then there is the ultraviolet in the middle and the extreme ultraviolet at the top. And I'm gonna put this line in here so you could see uh, the difference between these. Isn't that interesting? If you look at the top one, there's a lot of atmosphere sticking out above that white line. And what does that mean? Well, that's the tenuous, thin atmosphere that's causing, in part, these absorption lines that you see in the solar spectrum. So we can't just, in the case of the sun, see this indirectly in the spectrum. In the case of the sun, we can just see it directly. We can just actually observe it. And it means that the sun is opaque or transparent differently at different colors. It means the sun has a different size at different colors. That's a funny thing to think about. You always think that if you have it all right, but it really depends on the color that you're using. If you go to the ultraviolet and the extreme ultraviolet, the sun's actually bigger than it is in the optical. Now for a giant leap. I'm gonna to go to the stars. And I don't know if you've seen pictures like this, but they so fool you. Um, it's nice to see the sun and the planets on the same scale, but they're not on the same scale. The sun and the planets are vastly smaller and vastly more spaced out than you see in this picture. And although it seems like you just look from left to right to look at the stars, the nearest stars, uh, as you saw Alpha Centauri, uh, of which the nearest, I think, currently is one of three, it's, Alpha Centauri is actually a triplet, uh, is the smallest one, Proxima Centauri, uh, is 4.37 light years away. It takes 4.37 light ye years for light to travel from that star to us. And that's only the nearest star. But oh well, we'll take it. We'll take the Hubble Space Telescope and look at this image. This is an image of a core area of the um, constellation of Sagittarius, the hunter. It's a very pretty image. And there's one thing right and one thing not so right about this. The not so right thing is the size of the stars. All of these stars should be just plain points because stars are so far away that they are not resolvable by telescopes that we currently have with one or two exceptions, the really big, really close ones. But old emulsion on photographic plates, as much as CCD cameras that we now use, have this habit that if you put enough light in one place, the light bleeds around a little bit. So the brightest objects become apparently bigger, but only apparently. Now, in reality, yeah, they are bigger often, uh, but not always, but certainly not in the way that you would see in this picture. The right thing, however, is what I've been talking about all along. Look at these colors. The blue ones, do be a spectroscopist here. How hot are the blue ones? It's got to be around 12,000, 13,000, maybe 10,000 degrees, because that's the color that it matches on the charts I've been showing earlier. The darkest red ones, well, they must be below about a thousand degrees to be as red as they are. Uh, so maybe they're a little on the cool side there. The yellow ones are all with temperatures in the middle and it doesn't matter what they're made of. I do think I should explain to you what they are, stars, 
uh, that was one of the questions in the trivia. Um, and we didn't really know until the beginning of the 19th century what a star was about. There was a big problem in figuring out how the star could be bright as long as the sun could be bright as long as the geologists at the time were saying that they sh the sun should have been bright. Um, and it all started to change when Arthur Eddington <laughs> made the suggestion that, hey, um, it could well be that in the depth of these stars, hydrogen is being fused to helium. Often astronomers, when they're sloppy, they'll say it burns hydrogen. It, it doesn't burn. Burn means combined with oxygen. That's not what happens chemically. In this case, the core, the nucleus itself of the elements is being changed by collisions that add neutrons and protons to them so that this single proton of hydrogen becomes a four times as heavy object atom that is helium. And at some point, stars like this, including our sun, is going to run out of fuel, run out of hydrogen, and they'll start fusing helium into carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, and then it'll go to silicon, and eventually it'll even make some iron. But at some point in their life, a proper star has been a hydrogen fusion reactor. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about the big ones or the small ones. But if we go to the smallest ones among them, the things that are called brown dwarfs, they do not fuse hydrogen. They have a little bit of helium fusion, uh, of, sorry, of deuterium fusion, but deuterium is not hydrogen proper. Deuterium is a heavy form of hydrogen, but as you can guess, it has its own name, so it's not the same thing, and there is very little of it. So these stars for a little while can fuse deuterium, burn deuterium if you're sloppy, but not for very long. By the time we get to even smaller objects, we're talking planets. And planets have no fusion. Planets sometimes, like the Earth, have fission, where radioactive elements are split apart because they're unstable and just fall apart because that's how they were made in the stars out of which uh, the Earth was made. So the difference really is a star is a fusion reactor, a planet is not. Although we also tend to think that a planet is what revolves around a star, and it's smaller than stars, and all of that is true, yes, and often planets have a liquid core or a solid core, like Jupiter does, and like the Earth does, with an atmosphere that can be vastly different. Jupiter has an enormously thick hydrogen-helium atmosphere. Earth has a very, very thin nitrogen-oxygen atmosphere. That's a nice theory. How do you prove it? Again, light comes to the rescue. Here is where people, in this case, uh, Einar Hertzsprung and William Russell were the first two to put this kind of a diagram together. They said, hey, look at that. We can order the stars as a function of color, and eventually that became temperature, although they didn't know it at the time. And we can order uh, horizontally, and we can order them ver vertically, depending on how bright they are. Well. Brightness depends on two things. I said this before, when a thing gets hotter, it gets brighter per unit surface area. But it might also, it also has something to do with the size of the object and the distance of the object. So the tricky bit was, and I'm not gonna talk about that, the tricky bit was getting the distances to the stars right. But once you did that, you get this beautiful diagram. You get a diagram where most of the stars are aligned on, on this diagonal, far more than you would guess from just this rendering. The bulk of the star sits on that diagonal in this diagram. And the only reason they're on that diagonal, according to theory, is that they're all hydrogen burning stars in that phase. And if they're heavier, they are a little brighter and a little hotter. If they're lighter, they're a little dimmer and a little cooler, so they sit they align themselves on this diagram. It's only when they are very young or very old that they move off this diagram. So then you get stars, you can guess how big they are, like Betelgeuse up here, the upper right, Alpha Orionis, or the blue version of it, Rigel, Beta Orionis. It's a pity in a way that or Orion isn't visible, it's, it's a winter constellation. But if it comes back, try to see the colors of these things. Go away from city lights and have a look. Um, Alpha Orionis, Betelgeuse is the shoulder star, and uh, Beta Orionis is the foot star. 
And you can see in the same constellation two vastly different stars. One is a thousand times bigger than the sun, one is a hundred times bigger than the sun, and one is considerably hotter and one is considerably cooler. So the proof that stars are nuclear burning, nuclear fusing reactors sits in how they align themselves in this particular diagram. I'm going to make one more leap. I'm going to get to the small things. Exoplanets. Now, the first exoplanet discovered to orbit a sun-like star used to be called 51 Pegasi B. Uh, 51 is the 51st brightest star in the constellation of Pegasus, the flying horse. And the little b means it's not the star, it's something that goes next to the star. If it had been a capital B, it'd be another star. Binary stars happen a lot, but this is a lowercase b, it's not a star, it's a planet. And it was discovered by these two gentlemen in a picture here, an old picture by now, uh, Michel Mayor and DJ Kelo. And they're both really interesting people. And uh, Michel Mayor, I had the privilege of talking to for like an hour when I was visiting Switzerland just last year, uh, where he told me just how this all happened and how they got the ideas and how they got the funding for this kind of telescopes and how persistent they had to be to actually make that discovery. Now, of course, they've received Nobel Prizes and they're much harder to get a hold of because they're very much in demand to speak. This was presented at a meeting in 1995, 25 years ago, which was held in Florence, Italy. And I was there, I was sitting there in the audience hearing Michel talk about this. And I thought, okay, <laughs> it took me a while, along with my colleagues, to come around and say, boy, this is exciting. This is a new field of astronomy because just within months, the two gentlemen on the right, Jeff Marcy and Paul Butler, working at the Lick Observatory in the South Bay of California, uh, the San Francisco area, had confirmed that, yeah, they were right. This was something that was too small to be a star that was orbiting 51 peg. And the rest, as they say, is history. The International Astronomical Union has now renamed these things. 51 peg has become the star Helvetius. The planet is the medium and we are many thousands of planets along in discovering them. How do we discover pla planets? Well, I'm going to do this two ways. One is shadows. When a star is orbited by a planet and the planet moves in front of the star, hmm, it loses a little bit of light. And when it moves off, you get that light back. So it's the dip that you're looking for. The dip that you're looking for, and ideally, of course, you have to be careful, because it could be anything floating in front of the star, uh, you wait for it to repeat so that you have two and the distance tells you the period. And if it does it a third time at exactly that same distance, you say, I have a confirmed planet detection. A little more than three quarters of all exoplanets that have been found to date have been found this way, most of them with the Kepler satellite. An alternative that's also very often used is Doppler. Remember the speed traps and the sonar? And, um, this is what happens. The star and the planet orbit each other. They pull on each other. The star doesn't quite orbit, sorry, the planet doesn't quite orbit the star. It orbits a joint center of gravity. And the result is that the star also moves back and forth. And as the star moves towards us, its light is Doppler shifted a little bit to the blue. And as it moves away from us, the light is Doppler shifted a little bit to the red. And all you need to do is huh, all you need to do is measure for years and years and years on as many stars as you can possibly get together to measure these wobbles, to discover the wobbles and to measure the wobbles. Now, if you do that, you can stack all these spectra that you're measuring on top of each other. So every one of these strips that you're seeing here is a spectrum. And this is where these spectral lines come in really, really handy, because you can immediately see that the spectrum is shifting back and forth, back and forth. So it goes redward, blueward, redward, blueward. And these two things combined, redward, blueward, and the time map, tell you two things. From peak to peak, it tells you the period of the orbit, the length of the year of the planet, if you will, and how far it swings tells you the velocity. And if you know the mass of the star that sits behind it, and we are pretty good at knowing the mass of the stars nowadays, that means that you have a very good indication of the mass of the planet, give or take a projection effect. 
it even gets better if you have both. If you have a planet that transits and offers a Doppler signal, you can not only measure the size of the planet, but also the mass of the planet. And if you have those two, you can determine the density of the planet. And with that, you get an idea of, is it largely gas? Is it largely ice? Is it largely rock? Now, there's just a lot of ambiguity, of course, because it could be and often is layers, but it gives you the first idea of moving things in a diagram where you say these stars are made largely of gas, like Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or largely of rock, like Mercury and Earth and Mars and Venus. By now, just 25 years later, we know that statistically speaking, this is, this has not all been seen because many of these are too small, too far, too difficult to see, but you know your biases, your methods of lim limitations of your methods. We can say that every star in the sky pretty much has a planetary system with at least one planet in it. And with 100 to 400 billion stars in just our galaxy, you can imagine just how many worlds there are out there for us to discover. And if you want to know how many there are, when you look at the night sky, a nice dark night, the human eye can see something like 2,000 planets if you went all the way around the world, all the way around the year. For every one we can see, there's about 10 million ones that are fainter that we cannot see, that we need telescopes for, or that we just can't see at all, that we're just estimating exist because the other half of the galaxy should be there, even if we can see only the near parts of the galaxy. One more segment to go through. There was a question about size of telescope. It's called the aperture size. How big is a light gathering area do you need to get light? Well, the first is if you look at something faint and something distance is faint, you need more light to analyze it, particularly are you un are if you're unraveling that light in a spectrograph. So the main, one main reasons for large telescopes is to simply capture light. You know this if you're a photography person, uh, bigger apertures get better pictures in darker conditions. But it's also because we want to see things sharply. So if we were ever to want to make an image of say, a Jupiter-sized, uh, oh, it says telescope, a Jupiter-sized, pardon me, uh, planet, so replace that, this says planet, at five pars parsecs, which is, there's a bunch of stars closer than that, and most stars are further away than that. And if you wanted to image that, not just as a single point, but as something that has 10 by 10 pixels, which is an awful picture. If you got yourself a picture of yourself of 10 by 10 pixels, you wouldn't be able to recognize yourself, but it's better than nothing. But if you wanted to do that, you need to have an aperture of a mile. It's just not possible currently to make something that size. We can't make images of exoplanets. And we're trying, people make really big mirrors. This is a, 10 meter, 33 foot mirror, the Keck 2 telescope on the wide. Look at the size of the person near the bottom there. Um, people are building the 100 foot, 30 meter telescope for Hawaii. This is an enormous building. And people are dreaming. Ay, this is all dreams, most of which haven't happened except for, well, there's Kepler, there's Hubble, hey, James Webb is the successor of Hubble that's being built by NASA, all in the lower left. But to get to these bigger ones, yeah, Gemini North and the Subaru and the Keck telescopes like there in the, in the top end, they exist. But the really big ones, the 30 meter telescope or the large, extremely large European telescope are yet to be developed. And even those, they're far from a mile in size. So if NASA shows you pictures like this, you have to raise as many eyebrows as you have and think about them with as, many, as much salt as you have in the house because they're all artist impressions. We cannot see planets like this. In fact, in most cases, we may know how big they are because of the transit, the dip in the light. 
but we don't know the color, with very few exceptions. We have no idea of their colors, and we certainly know nothing about their bandedness or their rings and such. They're too far to visit, and you could ask, add to that, they're too distant to build a telescope to image. So we can't do that. NASA offering um, its Exoplanet Travel Bureau with all these nice posters, they're art. They're not science. We can't go there. We don't know what they're depicting. We don't know what it looks like in those worlds out there. But that doesn't mean we're giving up. So I want to show you one little bit of extra thing. We have computers. And in computers, we can simulate things. We can say, let's pretend. So this is what I did in work that was published earlier this year. Let's pretend we're looking at a sun, the size of a star, the size of our sun. And let's pretend that it's covered, transited by something the size of Jupiter. But just for the fun of it, um, for the Jupiters that are close enough to these planet, to these stars, most of these stars are much more active. So they have far more magnetism and they have far more star spots, the equivalent of sunspots on their surfaces. We can do an experiment and see what that looks like. And I can create a simulated magnetic map on the left and a simulated intensity map on the right for Jupiter-sized exoplanets. And of course, we can do the same for Earth-sized exoplanets. And I was shocked to be reminded just how small the Earth is. That little dot there at the head of the arrow is the size of the Earth. You can put 100, I think the right number is 108, Earths side by side to cover the width of the sun, which means you could fill the sun with a million Earths, more than a million Earths. Um, and it's going to be really, really, really difficult to get the signals separated from what comes from the star with all this structure that you're covering and uncovering as you move this planet across it from what's actually happening on the planet. That is not to say people are giving up. And one of the prettiest images that I can show you is this. This is a transit of Venus. This doesn't happen all that often. If you've missed it, you're not going to see one again in your lifetime unless things really, really change because it isn't until the next century that the next one is going to occur. But look at this. This is a tiny planet. Venus is the size of the Earth pretty much across this giant star. And if you look at it in the, everywhere, but particularly in the top left, you can see this thin strip of light. That is sunlight going through the atmosphere of Venus, the part that is transparent. But Venus doesn't have much of a transparent atmosphere. It doesn't really have much of an atmosphere. It's a little thicker than ours, but not too much. That's the light that astronomers are looking for. So just imagine the difficulty of doing this. You have a very bright star with a tiny planet going in front of it with a very thin shell of an atmosphere that is actually transparent. And that's the light that we're looking for, because once we have access to that, we can determine its chemistry, its compositions. Some people are even dreaming about measuring things like wind speeds. It is not impossible. It is being done, but only for very big planets around very small stars with very, and, and planets with very thick atmospheres, but it's just getting our feet wet into the method. So someday, one hopes we'll be able to, at least for some number of stars, to do this. Although right now, we're not quite there yet. Let me wrap up. Last slide here, the things I haven't talked about. Well, I haven't talked about these thin layer, these thin clouds that you often see in um, Hubble pictures. And, and if you read the captions, they'll say the blue is oxygen and the red is sulfur and the green is nitrogen. And that, of course, is not what I've been talking about. I've been talking about this thing glows and red is warm and blue is hot. Well, these are thin clouds. These are not dense clouds. So here, this whole picture of spectroscopy is upset. And what you're looking at really is, again, emission line spectroscopy. And that is just too complicated to go into in a one hour talk. So let me wrap up. My tools of light, this general astronomer's tools of light, is essentially disentangling emission, transmission, and absorption by looking at this mixture of continuum spectra and spectral lines, by 
looking at polarization of light because it tells me about magnetic fields on stars, by looking at Doppler shifts because it tells me about things moving towards me or away from me uh, rep repetitively if it's a planetary orbit or maybe they're just moving in one direction if a star is moving away from you, you can still measure that that way. And of course, at the bottom of all of that lies just measuring intensities, brightnesses, and making images. The tools of an astronomer are about making images and unraveling the light into its colors. And that is all it took to learn about the nature of stars. And that's all it took to discover exoplanets by the thousands. And all it took Oh, it was at least 150 years of science and engineering before all of that became possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Shriver. That was actually super fascinating. And I, I think I stayed with most of what you were saying. You did a pretty good job of breaking most of it down. I got lost in a few parts, but you brought me back. <laughs> okay, we have some questions for you. So um, for everyone out there listening, um, now's the time. Uh, if you have questions, just send them in. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll keep collecting them. And Dr. Schaffer will also be answering questions. If you think of something tonight, um, tomorrow morning you go, oh my gosh, I had this random question. Still send it in, um, and we're going to send them to Dr. Shriver. He's going to do his best to answer, and we will post them back on uh, this Facebook uh, event uh, with the answers. So with that, so Dr. Shriver, our very first question is, regarding the trivia question about the color of an object being affected by what it's made out of, would not the color change with the spectral emissivity of the object? some wavelengths would emit more. And I'm hoping you can, you know what that question's about. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the radiative transfer theory is a complicated business. Uh, it takes astronomers years to master some of that. Um, in principle, that's right. If you are somewhere between dense and not dense, and that's why I was separating the two. It's easiest to think in terms of something that's dense, which is completely dominated by collisional interactions between whatever happens in the gas. And then you have a color that is uniquely determined by the temperature. It really doesn't matter what the emissivities or the intrinsic colors or the comp uh, composite elements are of the gas. Um, once you get to thin gases, all of that changes. And there's this intermediate which is, I guess, what the question is about, that if you have something that isn't quite transparent and isn't quite opaque, you get a complicated mix. And yes, I steered away from that because it is a complicated mix. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is complicated mess. Uh, it's not a mess. I said mix. <laughs> oh, mix. Excuse me. <laughs> we, can, we, can, mix. we can figure it out. <clears throat> Um, but it, it actually takes really big computers to do this properly. There was a time when people were writing down equations and they thought, okay, if I combine all of these things with source functions and emissivities, then, then I can just work it out. But that's not how reality works. Reality is always very complicated in its structures from left to right. It doesn't really adhere to balances. It doesn't adhere to simplifications often. So sometimes with simplifications, you get a long way. Many cases, certainly to get insight into the basics and that's what i was trying to give to get the great details uh, particularly of these transition cases that aren't quite simplified this way or that way that sit in the middle it takes a lot of thought observation and computer power even today okay cool um okay can you see the lunar module and the flag from the Apollo missions on the moon with the James Webb Space Telescope, Hubble Telescope, or a big land-based telescope? Quite frankly, I don't know. Um, I know that there are some instruments that were placed uh, at every one of the early lunar landings uh, that are working, um, but you can't really see them. There, there are reflector boxes that were set up by the first uh, few of the Apollo landers 
that are used for laser range finding. So laser beams are being sent out to the moon and they reflect on those structures. So that's not seeing, but it is knowing that they're there and still working. Of course, they do, don't do anything, but they could have fallen over or they could have been covered in dust, but they're still working and people are using them still to measure how fast the moon is actually receding from Earth. It's a very slow process, but it is moving away from the Earth a little bit. Um, from orbit, you can see uh, the lander places and sometimes the tracks, whether you can actually see them. See, the James Webb telescope is going to be in a very strange orbit, really far, far away from Earth and Moon, just to get out of that bad, bad environment. We call it. It's good for us, but it's bad for telescopes because there's all that radiation uh, and light coming around that you don't want into the James Webb. Um, Hubble... I quite frankly don't know if Hubble's actually ever been pointed at the moon. You have, to remain, you have to remember the moon, compared to the star, the moon is an awfully bright object. It might damage the detectors in Hubble. So I would be surprised if it ever had been, but I won't rule it out. I'm not an expert in that. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, okay. Next question. So when you showed us the image of Venus transiting the you know, there's the multiple little pictures there. You you talked about how the size of the sun is different based on its color. Mm -hmm. Can you talk, can you just spend just another minute or two on that? Those were images of Mercury going across oh, Mercury, excuse uh, me. the sun. <clears throat> it has to do with at what point a gas becomes transparent. And that has to do with how well it is absorbing or emitting. Um, in fact, it is in such a case that if, if we look at, maybe this is a way to think about it. If we looked at, I'm going to do a little hand waving because I'm going to assume that people can see me. Um, look at the surface of the sun and take a point at which you send light straight out. That light is leaving the solar atmosphere at the point that it becomes transparent. And that's, Transparent is not something that's intrinsic to the location. It's determined by just how much matter is there between where I'm looking and where that light is coming from. Now, this finger is a bad example. This finger should be a layer of gas because if I now look in this direction to reach the same depth, I have to go through more atmosphere because mm. it's a slanted angle. And the result is that the point at which this ray becomes optically thin, transparent, as we call it, is, is in fact a little higher. This is a funny thing. So as we're looking on the sun, from the center of the sun, where light comes out straight directly to us, and go towards the sides of the sun, where light coming towards us really comes out at a big angle to reach us in Earth, you're already looking at very different layers. You're looking at hundreds of kilometers difference in where that light is coming from, just because the point at which it reaches transparency to the observer changes. Now, on top of that, there is transparency that's a function of color, uh, because after all, this thin atmosphere is, is not the dense medium I've been talking about. This thin atmosphere absorbs in different wavelengths these tiny little, very specific colors. And how much material of a particular kind is there and how grabby <laughs> that particular model is to light of that particular color depends on how much it is able to grab and contain within the sun. So you may, if it's a very abundant material, like helium, but also like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen in relative terms, you typically have to go closer to the observer, higher in the atmosphere, before that absorbing layer above it becomes thin enough that the light can actually escape. Mm. That's the best I can do without a lot of hand waving and a whiteboard. Um, it's, and and that's, that's what happens when you look at these different layers, uh, also on the side of the sun. It depends on how transparent the medium is before you see the transition between opaque and transparent. And I wish I could come up with an analogy in the case of clouds. Um, most people have flown through and have flown through clouds. And you can always see that if you look at a cloud from the ground, you might, boy, this is a nice sharp edge. But if you're flying into a cloud, it is never a sharp edge. It just 
begins with a slight fuzz and eventually you'll find yourself in the fog proper of the cloud. So it's in that, in that domain where from a distance it can look start sharp, but from close up it is not sharp oh, uh, that we're talking about here, right? Okay, okay. No, that's, a, that's a great way to think about it. Um, oh, okay, a couple SDO questions. So the first one is, can you talk a bit more about your work with uh, the SDO and um, did you design the satellites? We leave, the des uh, we leave the design of satellites to designers, to engineers who know exactly what they're doing. Um, but I've been involved with SDO from the very beginning, from before it was a telescope, from before it was a proposal. Uh, I was one of the members helping to write the proposal. And what you basically do in that phase is you say, I would really like to discover these things about the sun. And in order to do that, I have to have a telescope that can do these kinds of things. Mm. And you give this list to the engineers and the engineers laugh in your face and they say, we can't build that. <laughs> uh, not, for, not for the budget that we have and maybe never. And then you start doing a, a trade-off. You say, well, but I want to keep these things. These are really essential. I can live without that. And maybe that we can go away or maybe that becomes an extra if we have money left. And you begin to go in this back and forth between engineering and science. And at some point you reach this compromise of something that'll work great and that can actually be built. Hmm. At that point, you send in a proposal to NASA, keep your fingers crossed. Um, in many cases, it gets rejected, you get to try it again. Uh, in our case, we were, we were fortunate. I've gone through this in, in a number of telescopes. There's also something called the IRIS telescope that was built by our same group. Um, it's a very exciting phase to go through because in the end, when you succeed, you get to build exactly what you want. Hmm. Um, and then I, I had this fancy title of science lead, which basically means you coordinate a group of scientists from within your own institute, but also within the rest of the country, and in fact, in, around the world, um, into you nudge them into a coherent investigation package that says, now, after a few years, we have made enormous headway in these fields. We should really start focusing a little bit more on that. And can we now do this in the process? You write all sorts of academic papers into the refereed literature. We did try to send out as many pretty pictures as we could to the media in general. And we've written specials for like Sky and Telescope so that everybody can share in what we're actually doing and hopefully understand a little bit of the excitement. Why are we so excited about this? For SDO in particular, um, the excitement comes from two things. One is the sun isn't just sitting there. It's very dynamic, particularly the high temperature outer magnetic layers, and they cause all sorts of explosions. And I can say space weather, and you may have heard of it, but space weather can and does occasionally do bad things. It knocks out power grids. It causes satellites to fail. It can kill satellites. Um, and, sorry, it can kill astronauts uh, that happen to be in orbit. So it's an important thing to understand. And for an astronomer, uh, you have to realize that there is only one star in the universe in which we can see any detail, and that's our sun. Mm -hmm. So I started as a stellar astrophysicist, became rather frustrated at not being able to see what I needed to see, and turned to the sun to see that in much more detail. That's not to say that these two fields are complementary. See, and, uh, astronomers cannot, physics is all about experiments. Physics, you can tweak a dial, change a knob, change conditions. We cannot do that. What we can do is look at a star and look at another star and another star with different properties. So the combination of being able to see even very little about all these stars out there that have different masses and ages and compositions with the one we can see in great detail is what brings us further. Hmm. Okay, that makes sense. So then, um, so another SDO question then. So SDO is about 10 years old now. So what is, the, what is next up? What is the next up and coming thing in space based observations or is SDO still the cutting edge tech to provide advances in the field? It still is cutting edge. There's nothing better flying. Um, there's things that are different flying. I, I mentioned just now a satellite called Iris. 
um, we designed Iris in a way as the microscope to go along with Hestio. So Iris sees a very small patch on the sun in great resolution, whereas Hestio offers all the context. Magnetic fields have this habit of coupling things over large distances. So you have to be able to see what's going on. And then uh, the Iris telescope was designed to look at things in great detail. But the strength of the observatory is not its own strength, is how well it fits into a fleet of observatories that NASA and ESA, the European Space Agency, together have flying, looking at the sun and its surroundings. Um, there is now the Parker Solar Probe, which is a largely a NASA investment that is going to, they call it flying into the sun. It, it can't, it can't get that close, um, but it gets closer than anything else has ever been. But for those instruments to understand what they're measuring, they need to know what's underneath them at the sun. So that's where SDO comes in and IRIS comes in. There are telescopes that look not at light, but at particles or at extremely energetic light, like the Ruben Ramati Observatory, the RESI satellite, um, also a NASA explorer. There are telescopes, there's a big thing that was just launched just a few months ago, uh, the Solar Orbiter by the European Space Agency, which is going to go around the sun differently, Earth is going around the sun, but it's going to go on a different trajectory faster and much closer. And it's going to try and climb out of the planetary plane, so out of the ecliptic, so that it has a better view of the poles. Mm. All of these things together, and many, many more, including the radio observatories and the ground-based optical observatories, including, say, the new ones that are being built at Kitt Peak, right, at um, Hawaii, uh, Mauna Kea Peak, right now are what people tend to think of and call the heliophysics system observatory, because that, in the end, what it's about. It's... You think about the system being observed by this fleet of telescopes, and occasionally you'll take one out and put one in more powerful or in a better position or more tuned mm. to what you actually need. Yeah. It's never the single telescope that gives you, well, sometimes it's the single telescopes that gives you the answer because you might discover something. Like SDO actually saw a comet flying into the sun when it was really close to the sun, which nobody expected, which was a great thing to do. Uh, so it, that's how sensitive it is. It's this few kilometer object next to this one and a half million kilometer object that's outshining everything. And still you could see the thing evaporate in the atmosphere. But generally research is both for researchers and for observatories, a community effort. You do it together to make, it, make headway. Okay. So next question, um, have you personally discovered a new exoplanet star or moon or anything like that? No. Um, simply no, because my focus was entirely taken up by the sun and the space around the sun. Once you become a, a, a specialized expert, and certainly if you have a leading function at a big observatory, um, you're supposed to focus <laughs> yeah, just look, yeah. <laughs> and, and work on that particular topic. But I have always been interested in, in exoplanets, which is why after I stepped away from that function, I wrote this book on exoplanets, one of 10 billion Earths, trying to, for myself, summarize everything that was known. And I thought, this is so interesting. I should share this. So I wrote a book about it. <laughs> uh, but that's something that I've basically been having a finger on the pulse, so to speak, and just trying to figure out what all these brilliant people are doing on what we call the night side of astronomy, as opposed to the day side astronomy, which is the solar physics side. Mm. Okay, cool. All right, so we got a question about the TRAPPIST-1 system discovered a few years ago. Um, and you did touch on this, I think, in your, in your talk, but... Um, and I'm sure you're familiar with it. I think it was like 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. They discovered about mm -hmm. six or seven planets. Um, how do how did they discover it? How do scientists know what those planets are made of, their atmospheres? And again, I know you talked a little bit about it, but this was just a specific question about the TRAPPIST-1 system. We don't, we don't. <laughs> it's a simple <laughs> answer, but it's not an, that's not entirely fair. Um, I showed you this, this artist animation of this one planet pulling on a star uh, or one planet crossing a star. Now, the people in, in Belgium, they, they like their Trappist beer, which is why the observatory was called Trappist. And, and the first planet, planetary system they discovered was called Trappist-1 for obvious reasons. Um, 
they were very fortunate. When they started observing that star, uh, they saw so many transits that they thought, this, can, this, is, this is really surprising. This is not one or two or three. This is, uh, this is like seven star planets that we can just see transit that star. There may be more, but if the planetary plane is slightly tilted away, certainly the big ones that are further away from the central star, it's easy for them to miss the star and get from the Earth. line of sight of Earth and we wouldn't see the transit anymore. So I think it's seven. Um, a, B, C, D, E, F. Maybe it's six. Sorry. No, oh, there's a G too. It's seven. Um, the size of the planets, as I said, the depth of the transit gives you the size of the planet. Um, and essentially, that's all that you can get. If you were to measure in great detail, and I don't know if they actually did this, it might happen that these planets are so close together that they just aren't just pulled by the star, but they're also pulled a little way by their neighboring planets. Mm. That would change, make their orbits slightly irregular. And the irregularity might tell you more about densities. But even if you had a density, it'd be really difficult to know what it's made of. If, if I said it had a density of one gram per cubic centimeter, sorry, these are my metric units, uh, one gram per cubic centimeter is the density of water. But five grams of density, five grams per cubic centimeter is that of rock and 10-ish of iron and 0.1 of a dense atmosphere. Well, I can mix these numbers and still for the whole come up with one. And that's the problem that they're now struggling with, that that's, we can't get it uniquely right. Mm -hmm. We can only, for now, hunt for patterns. And the, and the hope is that if we look at enough of these planetary systems, we can get an idea of what kind of planets form preferentially out of what is always largely hydrogen, helium, and everything else in the little sprinkling clouds from which these uh, systems form. Knowing what they are made of, and certainly knowing what their atmospheres are made of, is really difficult. There are people that come up with uh, planets that are so close to their stars that if they were rocky, and if they had carbon in them, they could have, I guess, what you would call corundum rain. Now, corundum rain is another word for emerald rains, ruby rain. <laughs> so there's rubies raining on these planets, but that's in models. It's possible but it's not been proven. On the other hand, all these models give us a limited set of what is possible. So that when we start looking, we don't have to say everything is possible. No, not everything is possible. There are certain limits to what is possible. And then within those limits, we have to find what is actually right. Mm -hmm. Finding atmospheric structure of exoplanets is the challenge. It is the stepping stone that stands between us and say, proving that there's life in the, in the universe other than here on earth. There's lots of people working on it. The prize is large. The challenge matches the size. Yeah, it sounds like it. Um, okay. Oh, here's a little hypothetical for you. If you could visit any planet in space, where would you go? <laughs> I've thought about that. I'd like to survive it. Uh, Let's say so you can survive it. Let's say you got a special, <laughs> okay. uh, you got your space suit that... Uh, no, it, no, no, that's not what I mean. I'd like to survive it as in be able to go there and back. Oh, and okay, okay. Rule, rule, rules out everything that is outside of our solar system. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> true. Others will never get there. Uh, yeah, the, the environments that we encounter on Saturn and Jupiter are really tricky radiation-wise, and even building a spacecraft that can survive that kind of environment is very difficult, but it can be done. Um, I don't know. I'd love to go to... I'll just say one of these ice, icy moons of either Jupiter or Saturn. So okay. Enceladus, Enceladus is a nice target. There you go. Because, because the view of this giant planet right next to it would be great. The ice uh, kilometers, miles thick ice over what is an ocean underneath is great to investigate. I wouldn't mind that. Okay. So you just need to see it. Don't see it happen, but... <laughs> Hey, but I just need the hypothetical. So you're hypothetically yeah. going there. Get me the um, right. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. Is there a way 
to improve how well data on Earth can read images of stars to see their exoplanets. For example, instead of just building humongous telescopes, accelerating our ability to read the data we get here. Does that make sense? The problem, yeah, the problem with light is once it's recorded, it's changed some of its states. Um, it comes in, in two units. It comes in, in intensity and in something called phase. Anyway, and I haven't talked about phase, and most people don't talk about phase because once you record something, you've lost the phase information. But that's what an interferometer does. It records both the phase and the intensity. And out of that, it can reconstruct an image. So even though a, a radio telescope or an infrared, uh, a microwave telescope consists of all these individual dishes, none of which creates an image, if you record those two for each one, you can create the resulting image. And I think that's the path that we're going to go. We can't, at some point, we can't build telescopes as big as we'd like them. Uh, it's just physically impossible to do. Maybe we can build interferometers that work not just in the infrared and in the, sorry, I keep saying that, um, in the microwave and radio, but also in the optical that one can do it. And of course, people are trying. People are doing experiments with optical interferometry in some of the telescopes that sit in southern, in Chile, in the southern hemisphere, high altitudes. People are building some of the interferometric uh, tools to experiment with learning about those on the Hawaii telescopes. That's a way to create a much bigger telescope without having to actually fill this entire dish with reflecting material. That's the path to go. That requires technology developments, technology that allows us not just to measure the incredibly slow variations of radio, which is still megahertz, millions of times per second, <laughs> but visible light is very much faster than that. Uh, so once we get a technology that allows us to measure that, you can build effective interferometers over large areas. And then we have, in principle, the ability to see details as small as an exoplanet. Mind you, you're always seeing an exoplanet next to an awfully bright star. Mm -hmm. So that's always going to be a bit of a problem. That too is being worked on. You can null them. If you have the phases, null them out of existence. But that's an even harder challenge mm -hmm. uh, to tackle. I'm not too pessimistic that it will be done. I don't see it happen in the next decades yet. Okay. So... Speaking of exoplanets, we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. Okay. Um, do you think we could ever discover an exoplanet that humans could live on? And maybe that's a larger question about just other planets that could sustain human life. Well, we may already have, but it depends on what you mean with live on. Um, there are these planets that are, are called habitable zone planets. And a habitable zone planet... Uh, is a planet that by definition sits in a zone that that is the definition of it so it has a distance from its star that it could have liquid water on its surface that definition is being stretched a bit because we realize that if we go under the earth uh, we see water environments in which life is also living without having the need of sunlight starlight uh, to power it it takes chemical energy to power these bacteria you know, people walking around at the depth of 5, 10 kilometers, but bacteria seem to be doing okay-ish. There are those that survive that. The real problem is that we so often think of ourselves as it's we and nature. Um, but without nature, we would not be. Um, all of the oxygen we breathe comes from plants. All of the food we eat comes either from plants or animals. All of the digestion that we have inside us is being guided by bacteria that live in our gut and that help us pre-digest the food so that it becomes something that we can eat, actually live on. Um, so you have to meet all these prerequisites and you might be able to do it for a while in a spacecraft. If you went there, you'd have to have a pretty decent spacecraft because you're on routes for so long. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the planet as a whole is habitable. Mm. And then uh, many of the science fiction colleagues will say, and that is terraforming. 
And you just change the world into something that looks like the Earth, because it happened to the Earth too. Yes, it happened to the Earth too. And it only took about 2 billion years to actually make that work. So uh, <laughs> you, might be able to, you might be able to do a little faster. Is this so far, so far from uh, trivial? It's really, really, really challenging. But really challenging is not in principle impossible. But again, not in our lifetimes, not in our children's. These are, these are experiments that even for living on something in the solar system, we haven't really succeeded. There's a reason why we're not on the moon. There's a reason why we're not yet uh, on Mars. It's really difficult to bring a system with enough resilience that if anything breaks in it, you can survive. Yeah. Movies like the, the Martian Notwithstanding, which is a great movie, and it's actually one of the movies that is close to, yeah, this might actually work. But again, that was a survival scenario, not a, not a habitat scenario where yeah. you have hundreds or thousands of people living somewhere. So within the solar system, maybe outside the solar system, a really tough challenge. Okay, well... Dr. Schreiber, that brings us to the end of our time. So thank you very much. Um, this was very fascinating. So thanks for your time. Thanks for uh, sharing some knowledge. Um, and again, for everyone out there, if you think of a question, please send it in and we will be sending these to Dr. Schreiber later. Um, and if you'd like to watch this video again or share it with your friends, uh, uh, just go to the video section on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. You can find it right there. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those fun things. We have lots of updates for future events and a lot of fun content uh, coming from OMSI. And again, I know I mentioned it at the beginning, but please consider supporting Science Pub and uh, making a donation via the donate button on our webpage, or you can visit omsi.edu slash donate. Next Tuesday, June 16th, please join us for a very thought-provoking conversation with Michael Nelson. He's a professor of environmental philosophy and ethics at Oregon State University. Located in the Cascades, east of Eugene, the Andrews Forest has yielded surprising scientific discoveries that have changed our understanding of forest ecosystems. Uh, Dr. Nelson will share some of those surprises and present a new way to see science as a novel way into ethics. So we're going from the stars to the forests next week. So once again, thanks to our partner, Celestream. You guys are awesome. Uh, we really appreciate your help and uh, making tonight's event possible. And as always, you can get more information on our website at homsy.eu. Thank you everyone so much and have a wonderful evening.